infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's show. Now, Balamuthia mandrillaris is a free-living amoeba that can cause some pretty serious infection of the brain and spinal cord. It is thought to enter the body when soil containing the parasite comes in contact with skin wounds and cuts, or when dust containing Balamuthia is breathed in or gets in the mouth. Now, more than 200 cases of Balamuthia infection have been diagnosed worldwide, and according to a recent CDC study, there has been 109 case reports of Bal- Balamuthia disease between 1974 and 2016. Now, a unique Balamuthia case reported in a manuscript to be published in the journal International Journal of Infectious Diseases documents a case of the parasitic infection linked to nasal irrigation. Well, joining me today to discuss this case is Dr. Charles Cobbs. Dr. Cobbs is the director of the Ivy Center for Advanced Brain Tumor Treatment at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute, and he's the senior author of the report. Dr. Cobbs, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Well, let's start out with a basic question, not a real common parasite. So can you tell the audience a little bit, you know, what is this rare amoebic parasite, and can you discuss the pathology related to it? Sure. Um, I had actually never heard of this parasite. Uh, when I was in medical school, I had heard of Nagleri phalari, which is another amoeba that lives in um, lakes and and uh, uh, slow running waters. But I had never heard of this uh, actually uh, until this occurred. Uh, so this is an amoeba. It's very difficult to grow. It was not di- It was not even discovered until 1986, and then I think the species was identified in 1993. Um, when a group of um, baboons and the San Diego Zoo came down with uh, some type of fatal encephalitis and they diagnosed it then. But it's extremely rare and it's not something that most neurosurgeons like myself are, you know, used to thinking about. Now, this was quite an unusual case. Um, what do we know about the patient and was she, what was she initially seen for? So this lady uh, was a very sweet lady who showed up um, after having a seizure. Um, And I take care of a lot of brain tumor patients and patients with infections in the brain. And she had a um, enhancing lesion in the brain on the right side near the motor cortex. It was more or less consistent with what we see with an early malignant brain tumor. She had a history of breast cancer, but we ruled that out since she didn't have any other breast cancer uh, um, systemically, and um, I biopsied the lesion, um, but her history was significant for about a year previously, having had a, a serious uh, sinus infection that was not treatable by oral antibiotics, and then uh, someone recommended to her to use a neti pot, which is a nasal irrigation, so she used that for about a month, um, about a year before she came to see us, and um During that time, she started to develop a red uh, lesion on her nose on the skin, um, and it persisted for months, for actually for a year, and it got biopsied several times by dermatologists, and it was thought to be possibly rosacea or something like that, but no definitive diagnosis was made. And in retrospect, this is something that is seen with Balmuthia. Um, When the infection occurs, often people will get a red uh, sort of swollen red nose it doesn't hurt, um, but we think essentially that perhaps the fact that she was using this nasal irrigation neti pot and not using sterile water um, may have led to her um, infection of the nostril or the nose, and then that may have eventually uh, allowed it to disseminate back into the brain. Right. And that's really a key point that she wasn't using sterile water, at least at some point while during this nasal irrigation. Um, That's correct. Yeah. Um, So at what point in all this did you realize that you were dealing with Balamuthia? 
so I biopsied her, you know, uh, two, I biopsied this lesion and it was completely necrotic dead tissue, which is not totally uncommon for some malignant brain tumors. I gave it to the pathologist. He said it, you know, he couldn't really make much out of it. Um, and because we have, uh, often we'll refer our pathology cases to Johns Hopkins neuropathology, we sent it to them. And, uh, during the interval of the pathologist, um, looking at it and getting back to us from Johns Hopkins, it was a 19 day interval. And the standard sort of treatment of the patient, um, didn't really work. She got worse and worse and this thing got bigger and bigger, unlike a tumor. Um, and it bled. Um, and so 19 days later, she was paralyzed on one side of her body, very sick. And we were trying to scratch our heads, figuring out what was going on. And then the, um, pathologist from Johns Hopkins called and said he thought he saw amoeba in the pathological specimen. Um, fortunately, we had a very good infectious disease expert at our institution who had heard about Amuthia, and she immediately called the CDC in um, Atlanta and had them FedEx a, uh, a new therapeutic drug that had been thought to be possibly you know, efficacious for this amoebic infection, and we received it the next day and started the patient on that, plus a bunch of other antimicrobials. Um, so there was a 19-day delay, but, you know, I don't think most pathologists or neuropathologists would have had this on their radar. Sure. Yeah, and I'm guessing that the drug that you're talking about is miltefacin. Um Correct. Yeah, it's a drug that's been used with um, some kind of success with neglaria infections in the past. Um, so based on the whole case history and, and what I read in your report, you believe that Balamuthia was contracted via the nail rinsing? We don't have a um, another really good explanation, but, you know, this is something that has obviously been linked to amoebic uh encephalitis with neglaria. Mm-hmm. Um, the patient did not use sterile water or saline. She uh, she did use a water filter, but it was tap water. Um, but, you know, given the fact that she developed this rash on her nose shortly after starting a month-long, you know, um, nasal irrigation, I think it all kind of adds up and makes sure. the most sense. Yeah, very, very interesting study. Any final thoughts on this case, uh, Dr. Cobbs? Well, I certainly learned a lot and having never heard of this organism that didn't exist when I was in medical school. Um, but uh, I think it's just uh, it probably would benefit the um, ENT community to know about uh, when they recommend the neti pot nasal irrigation to extremely uh, emphasize, you know, emphasize uh, extremely uh, the importance of uh, sterile water, sterile saline, because uh, – it's an unusual thing, but this is a common amoeba that's out there, and if it's in the water source, it could lead to this fatal infection, and essentially the fatality rate is in the 95, 98 percentile range. Sure. All right. I want to thank you, Dr. Charles Cobbs, for sharing this very interesting case report. You're welcome. Nice talking to you. All right.